the late 19th, early 20th century is, is almost forgotten. I mean, he's not entirely forgotten. You know, there's a Caravaggio painting in the National Gallery. You know, his works are in museums, but it's just not, it, it, it's not the flavor of the month. It's not what people are interested in. It's not the kind of painting that people are interested in. So in the case of the martyrdom of St. Ursula, by the time you get to the 1960s and 70s, it's um, you know, still in an Italian private collection. It's acquired by the banker uh, Commerciale um, as a painting by Mattia Preti, who's a, a very kind of minor follower of Caravaggio from the generation But that's where they thought, because that's the other element, isn't mm. it? We, we think of Caravaggio as being inimitable, but of course he is highly imitable, highly and lots of people did. <laughs> It's huge, I mean, and this is a great mark of his success, that as soon as his first public paintings go on view in the church of San Luigi de Francesi, San Luigi de Francesi in Rome in 1600, he is a sensation. And we know from contemporary biographies that young artists are flocking to this church to look at these paintings, to copy him, his style, the, the immediacy of it, the fact he's using real people, people with ripped clothes and dirty fingernails, the very dramatic compositions, the, the very exaggerated light and dark, that is immediately taken up by generations of artists, and it has this huge popularity. So as you say, we think he's inimitable now, but actually, when you look back over over the course of our history, there are lots of moments where Caravaggio's, what we would now see as fully attributed Caravaggio's, were not considered to be such, and, and vice versa. And intriguingly, those shifts in uh, kind of valuation, and I'm talking both in terms of aesthetics uh, and money, um, they can have nothing to do with the painting. I was, you know, Artemisia Gentileschi. If you found a Gentileschi painting now, you would be very, very keen, I think, Angelina, for it to turn out to be Artemisia. 30 yeah, years ago, father, yeah. you would have been very, very anxious that it was her father, Horatio. And, and that is a shift to do with our interest in women painters. A hundred percent. And it's really interesting how that, um, how that's changed and, you know, thinking about kind of art fairs and art markets. There was a moment a few years ago where suddenly every Baroque painting that showed a woman at an art market was, was an Artemis. And they, they were not all Artemisias, mm. but they, they were all, you know, possibly attributed to thinking about because that was a, you know, there was, there was a moment where that was the kind of most important quality. And, and, you know, that again will change. You know, none of these things are permanent. It's a very kind of shifting... Um, well, it's interesting in Orlando, isn't it, that that's one of the... Th that Inigo Philbrick's presence didn't quite stretch to that notion that a, a whole set of social values were going to come into play, and that people would be interested in diversity in art, they would be interested in women artists. He missed that trick, didn't he? He absolutely did, and, and that was part of his downfall, is that he didn't see... He was absolutely convinced that this single painting of Picasso would go would go up for auction in May of 2019 and would make him enough money to get himself out of this horrible mess of, of frauds that he had he had you know tangled himself up in and he didn't see that you know Inigo's markets the ones in which he was really involved were Christopher Wool, Rudolf Stingel, Wade Guyton, all you know white American European painters and he didn't he didn't see that the market was changing and because the art market really only you only get to see the changes as it were in public seasonally when the auctions come around and so if a change has kind of happened in amongst the people who are buying at these auctions between the auction seasons then it can only become apparent months later yes i mean he has a painting done here uh, i think it is a, a, a stingle that um, that just sort of performs disappointingly all of a sudden it's quite like the unthinkable thing is beginning to happen the price is dropping instead of rising I think he, he, you know, a, a previous painting, very similar work, also a black and white painting by Stingle, but it was a self-portrait that sold, I think, the year before, or maybe 18 months before, for, you know, in excess of $10 million. And Inigo thought that his painting, this extraordinary painting by Stingle of Picasso, would go for maybe, you know, between 12 and 15. He really thought it was going to fly, and it tanked. And once well, it's tanked uh, at five and a bit million. Yeah, but no, but of course, but once that once that perception has got out, you're in trouble with that particular. If you're thinking of it as a commodity alone, rather yeah, yeah. than something you will value as an artwork. And um, just um, quickly, Francesca, you talked about the business agent. <coughs> um, how, 
Are there dealers, are there secondary market dealers in 1610 or are they virtually non-existent? It's a, re it's a really good question. I mean, there definitely are dealers because we know that when Caravaggio goes down to Naples, he goes down to Naples famously because he's murdered a man and for all the kind of celebrity in Rome and all his great protectors, they can't actually protect him against having, you know, a, a death sentence on his head. So he flees down to Naples and we know that quite quickly he's associated with two kind of artist dealers, Abraham Vink and Louis Finson. And it may be them who kind of help set him up with a studio, help kind of make some kind of artistic connections for him. In Naples, we know that um, later, um, after his death, when they return to the Netherlands, they're taking at least one, but probably more um, Caravaggio paintings with them. So there absolutely is the kind of beginnings of that market. Um, you know, I think in my period, we, we tend to think in the 17th century that the art market is based in, in Amsterdam. By the 18th century, it's in Paris, then it's in London in the 90s. It kind of follows the money. It really. follows the money. Yeah. It follows free money, doesn't yes. it? And, and so where there are people who are kind of willing to, to buy, yeah. um, the, the, the art market will go there. And that, to me, that's what's really interesting about thinking about Amsterdam in the 17th century as the centre of the art market. But, you know, most of Europe at that point has courts and you know, largely Catholic monarchs and, you know, church commissions. You know, certainly that's why artists tend to be going to Rome in the 16th, in the 1600s like Caravaggio did because you want to get all those religious commissions. It's a huge amount of money in kind of painting for, for kind of public places. In the Netherlands, of course, they don't put paintings in churches. So there's a huge market for kind of private individuals and people who travel, you know, British people who travel to the Netherlands in the 17th century are shocked to find that bakers have paintings and merchants have paintings. But that's the very intriguing house. thing, isn't it? That even though that market begins to develop in, in, in Amsterdam, it's not like a tulip bulb market. People are buying the things because they want to put them on their wall yep. and look at them. Yes. And have them as part of their life. Yes. Whereas you don't with a tulip bulb. No, no, no. You, you <laughs> just want to pass it on to the next man at a profit. Wait to but see it, what it grows into. But contem <laughs> contemporary art, a lot of this contemporary art will sit in a Swiss warehouse never appear on anybody's wall um, because it is there solely as an investment in Absolutely, and it can change ownership multiple times without ever leaving the Swiss warehouse, accruing value at each point and, of course, accruing profit for the dealer who is selling it. Um, it would be horrifying if we don't actually talk about the Caravaggio just as a work of art before we finish. <laughs> we really must do that because it is all about, uh, you know, more than money. And the wonderful thing about that show is it's free so uh, and and a work of art you know does not know whether you own it or not no. it, it gives itself freely to anybody who stands in front of it and you don't there is no vip area no. where it's showing something to people with money that people without money can't see so uh, just talk about that painting i mean it is an extraordinary he's he's taken that subject which is often big and epic oh yeah and made a tiny little I mean, it's so a big picture, but it's it's, it's, a, it's a close up, isn't it? It is. It's, and I think it's one of the reasons we talk about Caravaggio being very cinematic. So the story is um, the story of Saint Ursula, who is a British or Breton princess, who famously travels to Rome with eleven thousand virgin followers, and they're massacred by the Huns. And the king of the Huns, the prince of the Huns, gives Ursula an ultimatum. He says, "I've killed all your followers, but I'll save your life if you marry me." Now, I think one of the reasons going back to what we were saying before about why that painting became separated both from Caravaggio's name but also from the identification as Ursula is that most artists have depicted that story thinking about quantity and it's quite hard to avoid the lure of 11,000 virgins so you get kind of battlefields strewn with all these dead women and Caravaggio has done completely the opposite he has given us a very tightly cropped up close personal scene this kind of it looks as if there are five people there. I think there's probably seven actually looking at the kind of helmets in the background in a very enclosed space. And everything is playing out across a very small amount of space. So you have on the left, the Prince of the Huns, who's just fired a fake arrow. Which is the decisive moment, as they it say is. at the top of isn't it? That the exact <laughs> moment of her martyrdom. It is, and Martin Scorsese, the director, who's a great fan of Caravaggio, talks about Caravaggio as you come into these paintings in the middle of the action and it is exactly that it's a kind of freeze frame so the fatal arrow has just been fired there is a bystander between the prince of the huns and ursula whose hand is desperately reaching out to try and prevent it ursula herself is framing this fatal wound in her chest i mean we're literally looking at her in the moments in which she's dying it's well she yes yeah, she has a look of sort of slight astonishment but it's that it doesn't hurt yet you know it's uh, that's yeah. 
how instantaneous it is. And it's a choice, you know, it's something she's choosing. I uh, hope you've seen it, Angelina. Yes. You've been to see it. Yeah. Yes, it's wonderful. And I think part of the allure of old masters is that we need to keep on the ability to be able to read them and mm -hmm. to interpret them and to be familiar with the subject matter. And subject matter plays a vital role in provenance. Being able to identify something correctly, a theme, and then analyze and consider what its possible titles might be and what it's previously been referred to is really crucial to the tracing exercise. It would be quite difficult in this case to know the books and tell us it? Perhaps. Just from the image itself. It's a really uncommon way of doing it, and especially if you imagine that painting under really thick yellow varnish, really, really dirty, and you're only seeing it in the small black and white photos, and those are stories up until the kind of 80s were, you'd miss that Caravaggio's included his own self-portrait in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yeah. well, of course, that's the kind of the intangible, isn't it? That once you know it's a Caravaggio, you can, oh, that must be Caravaggio. Yeah, but, yeah. but until you know it's a Caravaggio, it might just be a exactly. uh, bystander. Can you explain one thing to me, Miss mm -hmm. Um the, the enormous difference between the bystanders and the Huns, King's collections, and Ursula's. Yeah. She looks as though she's made out of marble. Yeah. It's as though she's instantaneously been converted into a memorial for herself. Yeah. Pale. She's very, very pale. It is, as we've said, with the history of being put out in the sun, it's a painting that's had a complicated conservation history. However, that pallor, and Caravaggio's pallor as well, actually, because he's also very pale. He's more sallow, though, isn't he? But yeah. he, he just, he looks ill to me, <laughs> but yeah. That pallor for her, I think, is absolutely a deliberate decision and to me there's often something metaphorical about the light in Caravaggio so however awful that martyrdom is it is something she's choosing I think there is something about the kind of light of yeah. faith as opposed to the darkness she's of everyone she's around. already becoming a yeah. saint um, we have run out of time I'm afraid thank you to all of my guests the art historian and provenance expert Angelina Giannini Braga Orlando Whitfield his is out there and Francesca Whitman Cooper curator of the last Caravaggio there to meet you by do go if you can. Many thanks to today's studio engineer, Duncan Hannon. Next week, Kirsty Wolf is joined by Marilyn Robinson for a final lesson. For now, thank you and goodbye. The start of the week was presented by Tom Sutcliffe and produced by Katie Hickman. Now, if those figures aren't making sense, there's help on the way this Wednesday here on Radio 4. I'm Tim Hark, here at more or less with your weekly guide to the numbers and statistics of news and the average weekly shop, £110 more, 32.6 million GP appointments. 90% of fish and chip shops were selling shark. And when those numbers don't seem to add up, we're here to crunch the calculations. I did look at some, well, data? No question, your number is too big or too small. From the entire government budget to thousands of missing cats. A new series of more or less with me, Tim Harford, Start on Wednesday morning at 9 on BBC Radio 4 and on BBC 7. In quarter of an hour, Woman's Hour is discussing the long-awaited report into the infected blood scandal. Lula McGovern will be speaking to Claire, who's been campaigning for years for the wives and partners who became infected with HIV to be heard. That's at 10. Now it's Cafe Hope with Rachel Burden. Hello and welcome back to Cafe Hope, our virtual meeting place, a little corner for coffee, cake and conversation. We hope it's somewhere people can let off a bit of steam and open up about the challenges they faced in their lives, but also the way the human spirit can respond to those moments and sometimes, in the case of our guests here, turn it into something good, something transformative. There is enough bleakness in the world. And one thing I can tell you is that all our visitors will leave you with a bit of a lift. And I know the next guy coming in the door fits that bill. Hi David, all the way from Belfast. How are you? I'm very well. Good morning, how are you? Yeah, great to have you here with us. Can I get you tea, coffee, cake? Cake, please. Cake? <laughs> <laughs> Straight in there. <laughs> I've heard such enthusiasm. I'll sort it out. Is Lemon Drizzle okay? I'll be ready, yeah. Perfect. All right. Coming your way right now. We talk about transformation. Actually, Belfast is, of course, a city that's transformed itself in recent years. What's it like growing up there as a teenager these days compared to how it was when you were younger? Oh, these days it's bliss. When I was younger, I've said it for 30 years in the trouble, so now, now it's a more settled, more shared space economically. Clinically, it's changing. 
the infrastructure is improving. It's a lovely place to live. Now that doesn't mean to say that there are challenges for young people there, and that was something that you became aware of a number of years ago. Yeah, it was, and a lot of those challenges still remain today that existed back then, and that's mental health issues within young people, obesity levels rising, homelessness in young people, suicide rates increasing, and I say that's, if anything, from when I was a child, it's actually more evident today. Why do you think that is, David, when on the surface, as you say, the city is much more settled and at ease with itself? I think it's lack of resources. There are a lot of mental health units and mental health boards in Northern Ireland as a general are actually closing down. They don't have the capacity, they don't have the nurses, they don't have the funding. And it's just, sometimes just people feel that they walk into a brick wall every time they look for help. And you know what this feels like. You had your own mental health struggles, didn't you? I did. It must be 15, 18 years ago now. Yeah, I tried to take my own life. Woke up in the Ulster Hospital and said to myself, what on earth have you got yourself in this position for? But looking at where I was, I knew it wasn't just me. There are many other people like that, even today in Northern Ireland, specifically young people. So I created the concept of Belfast Child, added in the social inclusion part and the cross-community part and focused on healthier, fitter, more unified young people within Belfast. And that seems an extraordinary personal journey for you, but what was it then that got you through those dark moments, that moment in the hospital where you thought, I've got to do something for myself here? It all comes through the name, child. That's where Belfast child came from, because you can have your houses, you can have your cars, you can have all the luxuries, but if you don't have your children, you don't have anything. So that's where my focus came. But you've got to get yourself right first as well, haven't you? A lot of people, even to this stage, say that the organisation, being 11 years now unpaid, must drive you insane. But to be totally honest, without it, I would be insane. Was it one child that you wanted to help, or was it a specific service you felt you could provide? It's a specific service, but if we can help one child, then we've done it. But say we have 170, 200 visits in our premises every week. Say I still work as a, a support worker for a homeless community. That's my pay job, but our organisation is open seven days a week. So the days I'm not there, I'm in our organisation. Goodness me. So, so you came up with the name, you came up with the concept. What was the next step? And the funding. <laughs> That's a pretty big step. Yeah. Well, the first thing I did was to come up with the concept of actually how to generate our own money. So I got our own branded bottles of water made, which actually said Belfast Child on them. So I actually went around to all the shops in Belfast and asked them to actually sell our bottles of water. And in return, they would make a donation of the proceeds back to the organisation. The issue with that was there's a very little profit margin coming back to us because the businesses actually have to make money. So what I did then was spoke to the police about getting something that was called a peddler's license. So that actually allowed me then to go door to door and actually sell bottles of water with our name on it. That got us a lot of recognition. Take it forward six, seven years and we had employed 85 young people and trained them up to many sales people to do exactly the same job. And actually that got us in 2015-16 to the final of the Northern Ireland Social Enterprise Awards two years in a row for trade, education and employment. So you're going door to door selling bottles of water yeah. and that generates enough income for you but part of that process is also giving an opportunity to the young people who really need it who otherwise wouldn't necessarily get an opportunity. A hundred percent. That's it's all about creating jobs, it's all about creating, it's all about education. It's all about inspiring, giving young people confidence and the belief in themselves to go and knock on someone's door and talk to someone and explain about who the organisation is. And what are you doing with that money then when that comes along? How are you spending it? Where's it going? <laughs> to pay the bills, <laughs> like the electric, the overheads, the rent. Because you have a base, don't you? Yeah, we currently now, I mean, 11 years old, we have a 5,000 square foot facility in Belfast City Centre. Wow. And who comes through your doors? Who decides that this person needs your help, your support? Most of the work that we do will come through Burrows, like to the Belfast Trust, to like to the education authorities, um, like to homeless charities, disability charities, detention centres. Everything's done on a referral basis. Unfortunately, we're not a private sector operation, so it's like you can't just walk into our facility. Everything is just through the safeguard point of view has to be done through referral or recommendation. What was your primary focus when you started this? Was it about just providing a safe space? Was it about sports programs? Was it about training? What was it? All of the above. 
The paramount aspect was physical and mental well-being. We do boxing, we do jiu-jitsu, we do MMA, we do Muay Thai, we do health and well-being classes, we do nutrition, healthy eating classes. On our walls right across it it says shared space. In Belfast, in some areas it's still quite defined it. So this is creating somewhere central whereby young people from all areas, all backgrounds, can actually come in and actually use our safe space. And the class is uh, very accessible in terms of the low cost. You try and make sure that anyone who really needs them can access them. That's what it's all about. I mean, you can't differentiate between those people who have money and those who don't. Because that way you actually push away the ones that you're actually targeting. We have classes where young people don't pay anything. It must be tough sometimes because I guess you can't reach every single child, you can't change every single life that comes through your door. Do you find that difficult? We do find it difficult because we're stretched beyond capacity. We can only really deliver what we can do ourselves. I mean, we've always said if we had the backing financially from larger organisations, imagine what we could do. This is what we have actually done ourselves. I mean, all the maintenance is done by me, all the cleaning for the most part is done by me. I take the vast majority of the classes to keep the cost down. It's just one thing, you just have to pay in the answers. This feels like a total life commitment from what you're telling me, David. 100%. How many hours a week are you working in total then, including Belfast Child? I wouldn't even like to write that down and let my wife see that. I bet. <laughs> when do you see your wife? <laughs> after eight, after half eight. Oh my goodness. So how does she cope with that? It's my fault. <laughs> it's pretty much it's your baby. Do you know what I mean? It's your project. She knows I'm never going to walk away from it, so she's acceptable of that. But would rather I did give it away many years ago. It's tough. It puts pressure on a family, this kind of thing. It does. That's the downside. What are the upsides? Can you tell us about any particular stories or children who've been through your doors that make all of that seem feel worthwhile? Many of them actually come at different stages of their journey, but it's actually when you see young people going from I can't do that or I won't try that to look at me, I just did that. It's inspiring them to get employment or education when they've just left school with no plans in place. One person the question, I mean, you came to us seven, eight years ago, just on a work placement, and we have really have two jobs, and he's working those two jobs still, but he still on his days off comes back and actually helps us. And when people ask him, why do you do that? I mean, he doesn't get paid either. It's like, well, maybe give me a chance whenever nobody else would, so why wouldn't I be paid a favour? It must feel sometimes like you are stepping in where society has failed. 100%. It is. I mean, the same What's issues here? in Northern Ireland are the same issues. Mm -hmm. Well, just so we can understand how much this means to people that you have helped, I wanted to play you a voice note that was sent in to us. Hi Dave, it's Jordan. Just want to let you know how much uh, Belfast Child means to me and what it's done for me. It's really helped me out throughout the years. I've been with you nearly eight years now. It's got me from being down and out to working four different jobs. It's helped me progress in my life. It's helped me with my autism. It's helped me interact with people. It's helped me understand people better and how to act around people. Very beneficial in my life. You were there when I needed somebody the most and it's got me out of a lot of trouble in the past. It's got me back into sports. It makes me excited about life in the future. Thanks for everything you've done for me, Dave, in the past eight years. It really means a lot. That's an amazing response to hear. How's that feel, David? It feels good, um, but none of us do it for the recognition. We just do it because it needs to be done. To hear from somebody who clearly has been facing multiple challenges and you are the opportunity for that person to discover themselves and make their lives so much better, that's extraordinary. It is, and I can't get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> It's a nice problem to have though, isn't it? It is, it is. He's, a, he's, a, he's an asset. And it's, like, it's like days where I'm working in my day job, he would step in if he's not working and he would cover 
just to make sure everything's okay with my absence. What do you say to people who are listening who are thinking, oh, this is crazy. Why do you commit so much time to this? Because it's just one of them things you can't run away from. The problem still exists today. The problem will exist in 10 years' time. So all we have to do is create more individuals like the other person you just heard from who are thankful for the help um, that they actually receive. What would you say to the younger David who was in that hospital bed those years ago at your lowest point from what you know and have learned now? Things happen for a reason. Rotativa, <laughs> to meet you. No problem at all. Thank you, David Boyd from Belfast Child. It blows my mind how much time, effort and energy people like David put into their projects. And I think you've been blown away by some of our guests too. Loads of emails coming in to cafehope at bbc.co.uk. Like this for Graham Burton, who helps run drone searches for lost dogs. Ben says, I heard this brilliant work by Graham. And Steve agrees, who just says, what a lovely chap. And you've been telling us about the projects that you've been involved in, like this from Louise at Lindholm Oldmore Management Group. Now, she has started a community project to help grow a special kind of moss to kickstart the restoration of a local moor. What they want to do is create a carbon sequestering habitat full of biodiversity. She says they've taken small samples of this special peat building mosses and volunteers propagate them in a new mossery. They then want to grow the numbers of moss plants and ultimately help start the process of rebuilding the peat. She says, we see this as our way of doing something positive and practical to reduce carbon emissions and reverse biodiversity loss. It's really lovely hearing about all your stories. So please do continue to email us, cafehope.bbc.co.uk and we'll see you next time. Cafe Hope was produced by Uma Dere Swami and Nikki Edwards. The news is coming up in a moment after a word about a series starting later this morning here on Radio 4. The travel industry is booming. Global tourism is on the rise. And I'm not surprised. The excitement of discovering a new place is a feeling like no other. But here's the thing. Are we ruining the natural beauty local communities and attractions we seek out so keenly. I'm Rajan Datta. Having explored the world, I'm now exploring how we can stop over-tourism, protect destinations and the environment from the negative impacts of travel. The Tourist Trap, with me, Rajan Datta, starting this morning at 11 on BBC Radio 4 and BBC Sounds. BBC News at 10 o'clock. Iran has confirmed the death of President Ibrahim Raisi, who was killed along with his foreign minister in a helicopter crash yesterday. The wreckage was found on a remote mountainside near the border with Azerbaijan. During Mr. Raisi's time in office, he faced calls for an investigation into his alleged role in the mass executions of political prisoners in the 1980s. Here's our international editor, Jeremy Burke. Grace, he had many enemies. There will be plenty of people who will be very happy that he's dead. In Iran, there's always a reflex that you blame Israel. Uh, Israeli officials have been saying to Israeli journalists, they've said nothing on the record, but they're saying that they're not involved. And it is hard to see why Israel would benefit from what would effectively be a very provocative act of war. The final report on what's been described as the worst treatment disaster in the history of the NHS is due to be published this lunchtime. Tens of thousands of people were infected with HIV and hepatitis C after they were given contaminated blood products and transfusions in the 1970s and 80s. The Prime Minister is expected to make an official apology. 
The High Court is due to give a final decision on whether the WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange can be extradited to the US. He faces charges of sharing classified information about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. The public spending watchdog, the National Audit Office, says the government has no clear timetable for completing new post-Brexit controls at the UK's borders with the EU. Official estimates suggest the process will end up costing at least £4.7 billion. Pounds. The government says it is making good progress. The French disability charity has said it's absolutely scandalous that more hasn't been done to improve accessibility on the Paris metro network ahead of the Paralympics this summer. APF France Handicap called the city's underground system a black spot on its Paralympic legacy. BBC News. Maria Callas was known to her fans as La Divina, the Divine One. In Great Lives at 3 o'clock this afternoon, Harriet Harman tells Matthew Paris why the opera star fully deserved the title. Now it's Women's Hour with Neil McGovern. Hello and welcome to Women's Hour. Well, in a moment, an interview with a woman who has, in her words, been traumatised by the infected blood scandal. Due to it, her husband died of AIDS and she has HIV. Their story is coming up in advance of the release of the final report of the public inquiry. And Feminist Theatre turns 50, which is an achievement. But how is it defined and what is there still left to do? I'll be speaking to my guests in studio this hour. We'll also be in Edinburgh to hear about the street stitchers, the antithesis to fast fashion, repairing and restitching on park benches in the city. And also, what was it like to have Anita Pallenberg, the actress, model, style icon, and at times heroin addict, as your mother? We're going to speak to her son this hour. You can text the program, the number is 84844, and anything you hear in our discussions on social media, we're at BBC Women's Hour, or a WhatsApp message or voice note, that number is 03 700 100 444. As I mentioned, the long-awaited final report of the public inquiry into the infected blood scandal will be published later today. Now, the inquiry was announced in 2017. This was after years of campaigning by victims and their families. It's chaired by Sir Brian Langstaff. The inquiry will investigate the systemic failures over why men, women and children were given blood and blood products that were infected with HIV and hepatitis C and this was from the 1970s through to the early 90s. Approximately 30,000 people were infected, more than 3,000 have died, and one person is estimated to die every four days in the UK. Those affected received infected blood via transfusion, such as women following childbirth, for example, or people with haemophilia, that was predominantly males, and others with bleeding disorders who received contaminated blood products. Around 1,250 people with bleeding disorders, including 380 children, were infected with HIV. Fewer than 250 of them are still alive today. Some transmitted HIV to their partners. Claire Walton gave evidence to the inquiry, and she has been campaigning for years for the wives and partners of those who became infected. She wants them to be heard and acknowledged. I spoke to her a little earlier this morning, I began by asking Claire about how she was feeling about the release of this report. Huge anticipation mm. about what's about to be revealed to the greater public. Of course, we know um, what's been going on for the last 40 years. Um, but it'll be interesting to hear you know, directly from Sir Brian Langstaff, who's going to be reporting on what he's um, been investigating for the last six years because this is about the truth. This is, um, you know, Sir Aaron Langstaff has spent millions, this is millions of pounds of public money trying to get to the bottom of a, a scandal that should have been dealt with when it happened. And it's you know, decimated people's lives, not just because of what happened, not because of the infected blood products, in my case, with my husband, who was a hemophiliac. And um, this has been going on in my life for 40 years. Um, but it could have been dealt with. And on top of that, we've then got the whole many, many years of the cover of the way we were treated, which is part of the investigation as well, is how, how government reacted. And I'm bothered because of the way we have been treated in the past, because it, it will just keep, 
Well, the cover, we've put this cover up again. That's, that's a new thing. Yeah, but that's, we may have our day today. Today will be the day when the news is there, the, the, press, the press is there, the media, uh, the public are being, uh, some for the first time, really understanding what we're told. But then it's kind of, where will we be in a year's time? Let's go back five years to 2019. You were one of the first to give evidence to the inquiry then. Um, what was your thinking behind that? It was really important um, that I, as someone who was infected through my husband, um, was acknowledged and the evidence was put into the public domain. Because until that time, and still, when the scandal is mentioned, we hear there's 1,253 human relapse with infected HIV. Um, and also they also would have had hepatitis C, it turned out as well. But you don't hear that of that, many wives were infected. You just don't get that figure. And in fact, there was a, there was a press release that went out at the time with one of the lawyers I was with at that time, I'm not with them now, but they put a press release out saying 1,253 hemophiliacs were infected with um, HIV, and, they, and HIV it went on to develop AIDS, there's only sort of a couple of whatever it was, about two or three hundred that were left alive at that time. More have died since. And I said, you've not mentioned the fact that wives were infected. But we knew a figure roughly of about 70 um, wives. But again, we haven't really got the proper figures. And I was told it's a press comp, it's a press release, and you have to make a press release snappy. And I said, is not the best 30 women in it? And that's where my whole feeling, and I'm still watching it this morning, I've watched the TV, we, we talk about 1,253 people who were infected, 300 of which were children, it's terrible, but not mention the fact that the wives 